A very warm welcome to the Austrian American Society. My name is Philip Ozenta and I'm the president of this honorable uh, association. Uh, tonight is a very special evening for us. Uh, throughout the year we have a lot of events and activities, but this night uh, is a special one with a very, uh, I would say, spectacular highlight. So, Rainer, what's going to happen tonight? Thank you, Philip. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Austrian American Society. Central banking in times of poly crisis. We uh, took this title because um, beside all political challenges worldwide, we have still topics uh, concerning uh, markets, the capital markets, uh, money markets, and we have, we're very proud to have a very high level panel today in our premises. I just wanted to tell you a few organizational things. We are very proud to, to organi organize to, uh, this evening with the Austrian LSE Alumni Association and our media partner tonight, uh, derstandard.at, where our evening today is also streamed. By the way, it's streaming. We have a Zoom stream where all of you can take part in the discussion and also on YouTube, whatever links you have, please take them, and it's an interactive uh, organization, an, an interactive event tonight. Um, yeah, please write them inside, I will moderate the questions, and um, last but not least, just an outlook to our next event. Today, in one week, on the 24th of October, we are having an event here uh, concerning the Viennale, and we are discussing some film topics in Austria, if you want to uh, click in or come here to the center of Vienna, to the Austrian American Society, we are proud in. And now, um, Philip, we hand over to our moderator from the standard, Mr. Shigetvari. Enjoy Have the a evening. good evening. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, when I was coming over here, um, I was thinking about this term poly crisis, if this is quite right, um, if this is not a little bit overdone, but I'm just coming from the finance ministry where Austria's budget for next year has just been presented, at least to journalists, and I mean, the rest of the world will not care about this, but there was a lot of talk about rising interest rates and how this is eating away the space for, for the government to spending, so it's interesting times indeed. So well, very Warm welcome also from my side, and nice to have you here in the, in the audience and on the online audience. And I would like, uh, first of all, to introduce you quick and short, our very interesting panel here, uh, which we have right here. Um, to my right side is sitting Mr. Franz Sobel. He is uh, one of the experts of the Raiffeisen Bank International, I think a bank well known, not just here in Austria, but everywhere. And he's uh, dealing there with uh, the business of the central banks, the ECB and the Fed. So, an applause, warm applause for Mr. Sobel. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm also very happy to introduce to you uh, Professor Paul de Grove. I think uh, listing all his achievements and his papers from a CV would like take away uh, the whole evening, so i just make it very short. He is the John Paulson Chair in European Political Economy at the already mentioned LSE, London School of Economy. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Robert Holtzman. He also does not need a long introduction. He is since the fall of 2019 governor of the Austrian Central Bank and our representative at the ECB in Frankfurt. Thank you very much for <laughs> Now, you might notice that uh, this is an all-male panel. Um, I also organize sometimes discussions at the standard, and I know it's very, very hard sometimes to get, especially when you're talking about economics, female guests, and I know our hosts have tried very, very hard. Uh, we have one kind of a guest, uh, which is Monica Rosen. Uh, she's, I guess you already know, she has been working for years for the uh, Bank Austria as an expert, and I think uh, I have been informed rightly that we have like a short introductory statement from her side. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for this Super Tuesday here at the Austro-American Society on the question or the role of central banks in times of poly crises. <laughs> My name is Monica Rosen. Unfortunately, I can't join you tonight in person. I had to travel unexpectedly on short notice, but I will be happy to give you my thoughts on the current state of markets via this video message. 
As you all know, uh, events in the Middle East have turned horrific and bloody in recent weeks. And it is, of course, a matter of grave concern for the international community and indeed any feeling human being. Uh, if we distance ourselves from that consideration, however, for a moment, we have to say that the market reaction has been surprisingly muted. Um, there was a reaction in the oil price originally, but it didn't really last long or wasn't, wasn't really all that pronounced, perhaps not as pronounced as one might have thought. And equity markets, again, the, the human toll, uh, leaving that aside, um, took, took the news relatively calm. Uh, the market is focused on other questions. First and foremost, of course, inflation. The latest print in the US came in slightly above expectations. There is now a growing debate over whether the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, will indeed hike interest rates at their November or possibly their December meeting, or maybe also not out of the question, not at all. Um, as for the ECB, they maybe have made it clear that they are done with hikes for the moment, but of course there the growth picture is much weaker. The IMF has recently updated their growth projections, um, upgrading the United States and downgrading the Eurozone and uh, also importantly China. China is perhaps the big wild card this year. They've come out of their zero COVID policy, but um, the recovery is uneven at best and so uh, has, has disappointed quite, quite a few players. Uh, equity markets, as I've already said, by and large, have uh, taken this in their stride, have also recovered lately after a, a more than rocky September. Even tech stocks have, have staged quite a comeback. The earnings season is now getting underway, both in the United States and a little later also in Europe. It remains to be seen if in the US we indeed get another quarter of earnings decline year on year or if we manage to cross the zero line into positive territory uh, just, just barely perhaps. So overall markets are, I should say, quite, uh, quite nervous perhaps, but uh, on, a, on, a, on a basically positive footing as long as the conflict in the Middle East remains contained does not crucially spread to other countries, possibly also Iran. That would, of course, hike the oil price and uh, would, would lead to all sorts of further uh, complications that, of course, would not go unnoticed in equity markets. So overall, given the current terrible state of affairs in the world at large, I dare say that markets are quite resilient. Um, many players are betting on a year-end rally. Let's see if we get that, and let's hope that um, that, that may be a, 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 a difficult uh, and, and far-off uh, objective, but let's still hope that we, uh, that we see a more peaceful uh, period rather sooner rather than later. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great evening, have a lively discussion, and I hope to see you very, very soon. So, see, this is already great discussion. Information is not just coming from the front, but also from the back. So, there's, there's no, no one coming from the side. But, Mr. Holtzman, I wanted to start out with you. You just came back from uh, Marrakesh, where the annual meeting of the IMF and the World Bank uh, took place. And apart from the fact that it's quite astonishing that they kept uh, with that destination, uh, even though there was this horrific earthquake, could you give us a little bit of an insight of, in the discussions about inflation, about probably growth, and about the role of the, of the central bank? What were the, the main points uh, that you found interesting there? Okay, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be on this panel. As regards to your question, definitely the discussion in uh, Marrakesh were influenced uh, by the recent event in, uh, in Israel and uh, Hamas. 
because the question that was raised was, uh, will it have a major impact? And uh, the conclusion was, as we have heard, uh, if it doesn't go beyond what we have seen so far, if the risk remains contained, uh, it will not have a major impact. However, we all have a vivid fantasy. If it goes beyond, then we can fear many things, including in Europe, all bite, not in a direct, but in a very direct manner. The question with regards to the inflation, and here the title comes to the fore. Yes, we have a multi-crisis, poly-crisis, and this somewhat complicates our monetary policy because uh, uh, we have one objective, but if you have many shocks coming to the table, you have for not to have a trade-off, but you have to always consider the many side effects. And this is something which uh, uh, occupied us because uh, to the already fragile world, emerging economies, developing economies, now also weaker uh, major economies are coming. And this leads that our capacity to help out this emerging and developing economy is uh, and maybe a problem. The reason is that emerging economies and developing economies are already highly indebted. Uh, for this reason, IMF and World Bank want to increase the capacity to help. But this will only be able at the, at the cost of uh, providing additional capital, which uh, is not so easy to get nowadays. So the question of how to help the emerging economies and developing economies to get out and to support them under this current crisis. With regard to the inflation, here we are not yet out of the woods yet, but uh, what we have seen so far, unless a major development happens, uh, that we should be able to come to smoother waters 25, 26. Uh, but this doesn't mean that we can go back and say there's nothing to fear about. You mentioned, or Mrs. Rosen mentioned, that uh, we remain on a steady uh, state now. We don't want to increase uh, the, 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 the rates anymore. This is not fully correct. What we said is that if things as they are, quite likely we won't be obliged to increase them. However, if and as a further shock uh, provides uh, further pressure on the price level, we may need to have a further increase whether mm -hmm. we like it or not. That's an important point. Just one more question to add. Was it like a discussion? I mean, Germany is in a recession. Austria is in a recession. Um, growth is, is has come down very, very much. Was it like a discussion that the ECB is basically overreacting, um, killing inflation, but was that also killing completely killing growth and, and, and jobs and doing much more? And as it is an external shock, uh, basically not even helping to bring down inflation that much. Well, as far as a recession helps decrease uh, the inflationary pressure, this is of course taken into account. But as we have a price goal, not a GDP goal, this is not relevant for us. It's only as relevant as much as uh, uh, it is linked uh, with the uh, inflation and developments. So our the US is different. The US has two goals, the price goal and the employment goal. We have only one goal, and to the extent that our main goal is achieved, we can take care of others. So we take not account of it, and we should not take account of it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zobel, after the last hike of the, the ECB, there was like an uptick in markets. And, and one of the analysts I talked to, he said, well, this is because everybody is now expecting that the ECB has, has done too much, that they will have to uh, bring down rates again, that this is killing the economy. And because rates will go down, um, it's quite interesting now um, also to buy shares. Is there, how, how do you see um, these developments? Are they talking about the right things, the central banks, and, and what's the economic perspective in your mind? Um, first of all, I think they're talking about the right things. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, I, I guess the key um, market topic, at least for interest rate markets, uh, was the quite surprisingly strong increase in the longer term interest rates. Um, but this was not so much triggered by, by the ECB, 
but I would say rather um, um, following the, the meeting of the Federal Reserve, which um, was a tick more um, maybe um, aggressive, one could say, at least uh, keeping more uncertainty about what, what's going on. But what, um, what is shared, I guess, by both central banks and what the market took on very much is this um, refocusing on, on higher for longer, so um, meaning that it's not so much about is there is another rate hike, yes or no, which is very much up to the, um, um, the, how, the how the data develops. So depending how um, how expectations by central banks are fulfilled, yes or no. But by and large, over the next uh, um, three months, probably without any significant additional shocks, interest rate cycles are over, and we have already seen quite a lot. So um, the focus shifts to the next thing, and this is how long will central banks stay there. And um, I guess initiated by this refocusing, uh, also the market, I would say, also got a little bit nervous, um, and in, uh, particularly 10-year uh, um, interest rate or yields, uh, sovereign yields, increased um, in the US by more than 100 basis points in, in the euro area by a, by a bit more. And um, I, I wouldn't say this is only this high for longer narrative, but it's actually also uncertainty about how the long-term outlook will look like, and where will interest rates converge to over a five-year uh, time period. So a lot of structural questions are being asked, which are really difficult to answer right now. And therefore, I guess, also a sign with an increasing risk premium, I would say. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Professor Dickroff, uh, you've been writing a piece, or actually a couple of pieces, which have been uh, discussed a lot uh, by economists and by journalists, uh, also in the standard, if I may add this um, little bit of an advertising. And basically, I would, what you're calling it the extraordinary remuneration of banks by the ECB. Could you explain maybe to us, uh, to me, what you exactly mean by that and uh, make it as easy as, <laughs> as possible? Okay. Um, so as you know, um, as a result of um, the quantitative easing programs that uh, were triggered in 2015 in the Eurozone that consisted in the central banks buying government bonds and in exchange, crediting the accounts of the banks at the central bank, we have seen an explosion of bank reserves. Right? The banks that have sold these bonds to the central banks now have all their accounts, bank reserves, credited. And this has become a huge number right? for the Eurozone. This is something like uh, 3.7 trillion euros that is sitting there bank reserves of banks all over the Eurozone. Now, in the past, this was not really a problem because interest rates were very low and the rate of remuneration of these bank reserves was either zero or even negative, minus 0 0.5, although banks could actually, there were all kinds of ways for banks to reduce that. But anyway, things have changed dramatically with the raise in the interest rates. Suddenly, these bankers, they were sitting there and money was actually dropping like manna from heaven. <laughs> Suddenly, they got now 4% on what is essentially demand deposits, pure liquidity. How much do you get in, at your bank for a demand deposit? I guess that's close to zero, isn't it? Well, <coughs> bankers now get 4% for something that is essentially a demand deposit, a side deposit, purely liquid, 4%. And that's a huge transfer that uh, is now occurring from the central banks to the commercial banks. It amounts now to almost 150 billion on a yearly basis. Now, to just give some perspective, total spending of the EU on a yearly basis is something like 160 billion. That's the result of a lot of politics, a lot of conditions, if you want to get it. You have to satisfy huge conditions. Bankers get almost the same now on a yearly basis. 
without any condition. Mm. Wouldn't you like to be a banker? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you just sit back and you get rich doing nothing, taking no risks. So that's a huge problem. We have to do something about it. It's totally unacceptable from a fairness point of view that the profits of the central banks, not only the profits, also their losses, right? They make large losses. But all this is transferred to commercial banks. That is, I think, unacceptable. And we have to do something about it. That That's the question you want to ask me, right? There's a question. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to say thank you. There's, there's this great move. I don't know if the audience knows it. If not, you should go home and watch it. Margin Call, which is basically showing the Lehman Brothers scene. There's Jeremy Irons in one of the scene. Seeing he wants to know what's the problem in the bank, and he says, well, explain it to me like to a dog or a puppy. I'm not here because I'm so smart. So he did a great job in explaining it to me like I understand it. But I have one more question just to understand this. Um, why does the ECB actually pay such high interest rate for uh, this deposit facility? So what's the yeah. economic sense behind it? Yeah, now I'm afraid I might become too technical, but please jump on me if, if I am, right? So the problem that, that um, central banks face now is that there is such a disequilibrium in the market for bank reserves, right? There is a huge supply, and the demand is relatively limited. I would have to have a blackboard to show you demand and supply, but I can do without it. And as a result, um, it appears to be impossible to raise the interest rate today, or since the ECB started, with its program of raising interest rates, except by remunerating these bank reserves. Mm -hmm. And then these bank, the remuneration on these bank reserves becomes a flaw in the money markets. Right? So the, the central banks raise the interest rate on these deposits, and then this becomes the, the minimum rate, because nobody, no, no commercial bank will want to lend in the money market if they can get 4%, except if in the money market they can also get 4% plus something, right? So that, that's the mechanism that now exists, why central banks are, are doing this. Um, but I think we propose an alternative to that, that would prevent these large transfers from occurring, at least to a certain degree. Before we go to that alternative, maybe, um would like Ms. Holtzman to ask, is, is it right that, that this is, uh, is Professor Podigrov right, that this is a problem and that we have here a problem in basically a central bank giving away so much money to the, I think it's more than 1% of GDP in, in It's in a, a, a of 1%, it varies from one country to the other. In Germany, it's higher. Um, in, in Austria, I think it's about 1%. Um, but it's huge, I mean, it, one, why, why give 1% to bankers and they do nothing? I mean, this is just <laughs> unconditional. I and, mean, and we have our banks already earning record profits. So, Mr. Holtzman, is, is, that, is that a problem? A huge problem, uh, because what you have for, if you pay on your, uh, if you remunerate the banks with 4%, then the question is how much you get on the asset side. On the asset side, we have all those bonds on the asset side, we get at the moment slightly above zero, which means that you get nothing there on the asset side. On, the, on your liability side, you pay 4%, which means we have a huge, huge deficit. Not only us, sir, essentially all banks in Europe and other countries we have this. And this means that we soon will have for, uh, losses which make our equity capital negative. And a central bank can have a negative equity capital, but uh, to say, technically, it should create no problem, but from the reputation, it creates a problem. And uh, we don't have to recapitalize as a central bank. A normal bank, which is negative capital, if you don't recapitalize, you know, you're out of the market. Which means uh, that uh, uh, given this, uh, this situation, uh, there may be a request where you have to recapitalize. You have to go to the Minister of Finance and ask him, could you give me a few billion? Well, if you were to go to the minister and say, if you give me a few billion, recapitalization, you're losing your monetary independence. And the result of it, very much interested uh, uh, in order to change this. And uh, based on uh, 
Paul's uh, very forceful movement. Uh, I uh, also promoted his idea uh, strongly internationally, and you may have read some of the uh, some of the reactions there. We had the idea ourselves, but Paul was so convincing that I could convince others in order to follow it. So there are now the German Bundesbank and a number of other countries who say we need to do it. There are two ways of doing it. The one is, how to say, to say, or, uh, we, you have these reserve requirements. Let's increase them to 10% and don't. Uh, and yeah. Okay, not technically enough. No, it's, it's very, just... Yes. Uh, my question would be, is it also a problem from, I mean, we have in Austria now talking about this excess profits in certain industries, I mean, energy industries talked about, banks are talked about, is this like also a problem in your eyes for, for society that is 1% that we're not using it to build schools or roads, but giving it to banks, or is this not so much of a topic? No, and the thing is, you cannot uh, uh, spend money twice. Mm -hmm. If uh, the banks have it, we don't have it, and if we don't have it also, we cannot remunerate uh, uh, the Minister of Finance as we did in the past, of which you can build uh, schools. So what we have there, there is, as Paul pointed out, a fully unjustified transfer of our, of our gains uh, to say, okay, how shall we, what shall we do? Shall we take it to the central bank? I would say yes until we have a position that we don't make losses anymore. And this is equivalent if uh, the Mr. Finance takes the money, raises a profit tax, and then gives us the money to recapitalize the bank. That's about the uh, simplest one. I prefer the simple way we, we raise, uh, we, 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 we do not remunerate a certain share of the surpluses, and, the, and then it allows us to reduce our losses. Okay, before we come to possible solutions, I mean, this is not a difficult standpoint as you're coming from a bank, um, but <laughs> how, do you, how do you see this, uh, this, this discussion? Uh, is it because of, of past errors probably of the central bank that now they want to take away the bank's money or how do you view this? Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's past errors. It's just um, we have seen very large macroeconomic fluctuations, a shift from a um, yeah, um, deflationary, disinflation scenario to a pro-inflationary scenario in a very short period of time, which was completely unexpected in that pace. Um, so, and, and that's the consequence of shifting from a very loose monetary policy where the balance sheets have been increased uh, by a lot, not only by the ECB, but also by the Fed, by the um, by the Bank of England, by the SMB. Um, and um, the strategy was to have a lot of liquidity in the market, also the strategy to in decrease the minimum reserve requirements from 2% to 1% in 2011 was to facilitate spending and, and loan supply by banks. Um, and now, of course, you're in a completely different environment where um, actually, you know, loan supply and loan demand is very, very weak, uh, but also on purpose, right? So that's, that's the idea of, uh, of tight monetary policy, and that's the idea of increasing interest rates um, by an in a extraordinary pace. So, uh, I mean, what I would like to, uh, to point to maybe is, um, so f first and foremost, it's about bringing inflation down. So this should be the top priority. Um, and, um, um, then, um, if this is secured, one can of course think about to to fine tune, right? How uh, how is this uh, uh, best uh, achievable? But do you view um, this as kind of a bank bashing, or is that? Uh... Uh, I I don't see it as a bank bashing in that respect. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's. A, um, I, I guess it's always a way how to make a point, right? And. Sometimes we have to uh, to be um, yeah tease a little bit, but uh, on um, but the key point I, I guess is uh, what to do with this enormous balance sheet. How to bring the balance sheet down? If you bring the balance sheet down, then also the remuneration of banks and excess liquidity uh, will uh, will decrease. And uh, we haven't heard a lot about how how to do this. I mean. Some has already happened uh, by 
um, uh, maturing uh, longer term refinancing uh, possibilities for the banking sector. So about um, more than a tr um, trillion of, of the balance sheet or excess liquidity has been quite rapidly and also quite unexpectedly in its pace been reduced also on this side of the banks, one has to say. Um, and, and now it's kind of, um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not that, it's not that easy, uh, I would say, um, to, um, to increase the minimum reserve requirements in a very short notice, up to 10%. But one last point can and then I, I finish. I think if, if you make me in power, I can do it tomorrow. <laughs> now, one, one, one last point. Uh, I, I know it's, it sounds, it sounds I want to very... I do it tomorrow. Yeah, you can do it tomorrow. <laughs> you can do it tomorrow. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It sounds very easy. If it can... can... It is a but, good argument. Okay. Yeah, no, the, world, the world is complex. Right? Okay, maybe, but, maybe <coughs> just to, yeah. just to uh, stick to my point, okay. like explain it to... It's very no, it's a good point. Just <laughs> this minimum reserve requirements. Um, what is that? Why is it there? And how could it help us um, to basically change this, this problem? I think it would be important to explain it. Well, traditionally, central banks have imposed minimum reserve requirements. In, in the tra traditionally, this was an essential tool. It's still an essential tool in many emerging countries, right? Where they use it as a tool of monetary policy, also as a tool to stabilize the banking sector, because the banking sector is inherently unstable, right? And, and you need these tools to do that. So we have had it in the past and we essentially eliminated it. Yeah, but what is it? What is it? Mm -hmm. Or oh, it's just telling the banks, um, let me give an example. Suppose a bank have, has 100 of deposits, right? And you would tell the banks, okay, you have to hold 5% of your deposits in the form of bank reserves. That means five. And this would be a deposit at the central bank. And this could be then a deposit that you decide not to remunerate. And you're, and you're, not, say, you're not allowed to lend more than this. That's uh, right. You, you don't remunerate. And banks have also excess reserves. And that is our proposal. You would actually do the following. Take again my example. A bank has 100 of deposits and has reserves, bank reserves of 10, right? So they hold bank reserves, which is 10% of their deposits. You would say, okay, half of this, we now tell you the good news, bankers, is going to be minimum reserve requirement unremunerated. So five would not be remunerated anymore. And the other five would be the excess reserves. That would continue to be remunerated. And then the central banks can actually continue to do what they do today if they want to raise the interest rate, they just raise the deposit rate, or if they lower it, they can do it, and this would not affect monetary policy at all. That's why I take a little bit of objection to, to what you say, oh, we first have to fight inflation. Of course we have to fight inflation, but, but we can do it without transferring all this money to, to commercial banks. And, and so one, one way, then, is this, what they call two-tier minimum reserve requirements. So you, you, you say to the banks, part of it will be minimum reserves, not remunerated, the other part will be remunerated. Just correct me, if, if I understand it correctly, it's basically the minimum reserves is, is the share what you have to have on central bank money as a bank uh, regarding to your uh, total, basically, uh, deposits That's out right. there. You so take, the, You take deposit, of course, the world is complicated, huh? So how do you define deposits? There are all kinds of problems there, but um, basically you define the deposits of a bank and you tell the banks, you have to hold X percent of that in the form of bank Currently reserves. Currently, it's 1 percent. Now, it's 1 percent. And note the following. The ECB, you know it better than I do, has decided recently in July, I think, that the 1 percent minimum reserve requirement that until then was remunerated will not be remunerated any longer, which opens a window of opportunities. Now, the ECB can actually say, OK, it's 1 percent, but let's make it 2 percent or 3 percent or 4%, it has the tools to do it. You said it's difficult, nothing easier, right? But um, just one more question. 
Um, but if you do that, first of all, the task is to fight inflation. Uh, yeah. and you mentioned the effect on the money market. So we want interest rates to go up, and That's we want on the. So how would that if if how would that change this calculation? And it would make it harder for banks to lend money. Uh, That's precisely it? what you want to do. Okay. I mean, actually, it would increase the effectiveness of monetary policy in fighting inflation, right? That's, that's the thing. I've heard Lagarde saying the opposite. We cannot do it. We cannot change this because this would endanger the transmission, or the way they call it, the transmission of monetary policies. It's the other way around. It would be more effective because you have two tools. You have the interest rate, you raise the interest rate, and at the same time, tell the banks, we raise the minimum reserve requirements. And that tightens the grip on the banks. And actually, what happens is that you might possibly even not have to raise the, the interest rate so much because you have the other tool exactly. that can enhance this. So you have more possibilities for a central bank. Why not use a tool that is possible there? So it makes your monetary policy more effective and at the same time it does away with this unacceptable large scale transfer of profits of central banks to commercial banks. Gunnar Holtzman, do you want you, have been nodding quite intensively, so do you want to add something? And why hasn't this been done yet by the, by the ECB? Uh, did you not, why did you not talk to Madame Lagarde? Well, I to say we talked about it, and uh, it's part of our discourse. What we have for, uh, well, frankly speaking, some didn't dare to be so blunt and say uh, what Paul expressed, that this is a huge transfer of our money to the banking system. That's essentially what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, required Paul Bush there to say, it's a transfer of money to the banking system, and you can justify it with monetary policy objectives, because it's both ways of tightening, either through the interest rate or through the, uh, through the reserve requirements there. But one also has to say, in the past, uh, to, to our unconventional monetary policy, the need in order to do things unconventionally, because we couldn't go with the interest rate to find the negative territories, we threw a lot of money into the economy. A lot, a lot of money. And it's still there, it's here in the reserves. Now we have to take it out. We do it, we finish Deltro, this special support of the banking system and the customers, uh, which costed us dearly at the euro. Here we subsidized officially with our money. Now we still have a lot of money outside and we have to bring it in. That's the reason why we stopped repurchasing in some programs, not in others yet. But there's still a lot of money out there. And uh, uh, so we need to take this money out. And this would be a possibility also in addition to this monetary effects there, to take liquidity out of the system. Okay. Before we turn to some questions from the audience, uh, I think you wanted to add up something to this interesting uh, discussion. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think the euro area system is a complex system, and I think here uh, it's it's fair, fair to state that currently excess liquidity in the euro area is quite unequally distributed, right? So just to give an example, uh, even though there are uh, 3,600 uh, uh, billion of excess liquidity in the euro area system, right? Um, the um, Italian banking sector, for instance, uh, at the current state could only um, bring up um, minimum reserve requirement of 2%. So increasing uh, minimum reserve requirements above that level would imply a redistribution of reserve within the euro area. And of course, this is possible, and this, uh, but this might <coughs> have side effects. So it's also the question, how much trust does one have in the European money market, which since the global financial crisis have not really been that active because everybody went to the central bank. So switching on this system from one day to the other in an extent of increasing minimum reserve requirements to a level which cannot be applied to in every uh, country has quite significant implication for, or could have quite significant implication for financial stability. 
why is it in Italy just short question is so different from why is Italy so different here? Um, I mean, one reason, I guess, uh, is that in Italy, due to um, higher risk premiums on the on the sovereign debt, and I, I guess I guess you're aware of that, that actually in Italian banks can um, uh, can hold uh, sovereign bonds at um, interest rates above the deposit facility rate of the ECB. Mm -hmm. So that they do not need it that, that much. Okay, so um, do we have some questions from the audience? I think we have a mic probably coming. Some questions from the audience here. Yes, please. So there is one important thing, just as we have some time constraints and probably we have some other topics, keep it short and crisp. I try. You mentioned that the ECB is now buying state loans from banks and that floods the banks with money. But the banks had to buy the loans themselves and they had to spend money for that. But where does the additional money come from? Um, what I was saying is that in the past, during the period 2015 until about a year ago, um, the central banks were buying government bonds. The idea, as, as, as you said, was to generate some push in, in the economy, more liquidity to lead to strong economic activity. This was the intention. Um, so this has led, this is a legacy problem, right? The, the bank reserves that are now there are the legacy of that past policy. And ideally, in the long run, we would like to take it out again, right? as, as um, you said. But this will take time, because we cannot just in a short period of time start selling all these bonds in the market. You would Easy. be in trouble, huh? <laughs> or maybe not, because you, you <laughs> that, that creates all kinds of opportunities also. So we, this is going to be a very long process. It will take time for this to happen. And that's why, in the meantime, we have to do something different. But I'm not sure I, I, I got your question completely. I, I, said, I thought that, that the central bank is only allowed to buy on the secondary market yeah? and not directly sure. from the states. So that the first step is banks buy state loans. And then they sell it to the central bank. That's right. But the banks had to spend money for buying state, state loans, so that it's, it's, it's neutral, I would say. They first, they finance the state, and then they get the money from the central bank. You mean the banks, they were holding bonds, and they sold it. Yeah, they bought, they bought the bonds in the past. This is part of their portfolio. And they sold it to the central banks in order to obtain liquidity. And now get remuneration on that. But that, uh, is a, is... that is a net creation of money, right? This is something, this is money that is created there, and that makes it possible, it, at least in principle, for a bank to expand loans and to, to lead to a stimulus in the economy. This was the, the intention that uh, central banks were pursuing. We have one more, uh, we have one question, I think, from the online audience. But before we go to that, I think we have to, one more question, uh, Mr. Olson. Could you give us just a short idea of, now we have talked a lot about whole, this whole liquidity being created uh, because of the central bank buying bonds. So how, uh, and this excess th three point something trillion, if I remember that correctly. So what's the way forward of, of bringing this down? Is it just waiting because these bonds have a certain couple of years uh, until they have to be paid back? Or how does this work? Well, the normal way how it works is that uh, if a bond matures, how to say you let it out and it disappears from your account because it's gone. Of course, you can also try to get rid of it, but as you bought it at a cheap price, how to say the value is high, you make a loss. So what we want to do is uh, to uh, let mature the bonds uh, which we have uh, uh, in the portfolio on the active side there, because if we sell it now, we would uh, and get rid of them, uh, we would make huge losses. 
So that's the reason why uh, making, uh, uh, reducing liquidity by, if you want so, taking a little bit of the profits away from the banks, it's also a way to get liquidity out of the market. It's a kind of quantitative tightening, <laughs> which uh, we are doing, which have not fully started in all areas. We started it with Deltro, it's almost gone. Uh, we have the asset purchasing program and order program where we don't re purchase anymore, nothing. We still have the, uh, the pandemic emergency purchasing program where we plan uh, to stop repurchasing by the end of uh, 24. These are all ways of doing it. Why are we so careful? Because what we know is that the markets are at one moment, if you do the tightening too fast, you create a problem. You saw it in the UK two years ago. You saw it in other countries. So financial stability is a major part of it. For this reason, using uh, this kind of taxation of the banking system, they can... The problem is interest rates going it, up it, too it, strongly it, for countries it, it, and, it's, and it, it, it's, it's a way in order to avoid uh, mishaps to happen on the financial market. Okay, so now I think we have a question from the online audience. Uh, <coughs> if you have questions here in the audience, please raise the hand and um, she, this lady comes to you with a microphone. In the meantime, some questions from the uh, digital audience. Um, question to Governor Holtzman um, is how he expects the banks to react on, this, on his goal to reach a minimum reserve of 10%. Does he think that the, uh, that the vulnerable banks, for instance, Italy, France or CEE, could handle this? Well, with regard to the magnitude, wow, 10%. The uh, Czech National Bank had recently increased their reserve requirement to 10%. So it's not something which is unheard, which I never saw. Uh, the uh, Croatian Central Bank, before joining the euro, had a reserve requirement of 9%. So it's nothing unheard there. Yes, I mean, the point uh, with regard to Italy is correct. Uh, if and as you have different banks in different situations, you have to be careful. But what we also saw with regards to this uh, Teltro, this targeted long-term uh, financing operation, where we had outstanding uh, uh, offers to the banks over 2,000 billion euros, so a trillion, what has happened there, we rolled it back within one and a half years because we gave the banking system a tight line. We even tightened the line there and everything could be financed, including in Italy. We chose, if and as you announce it, uh, allow the banking system to adjust, you can do it. You can't do it overnight. I mean, we, we know that. But if you do it within a few months, you can do it. OK. And I think we have a question in um, Hello. My yeah, it seems to work. Can you hear me? Oh, OK. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful discussion. My name is Matthias. Um, um, nine years ago, Professor Grava was very fortunate to be a student in your seminar at the LSE. It was one of my favorite seminars, it was extremely interesting. Uh, I have two questions. The first is, um, you outlined in London that the EMU is an, is an imperfect monetary union. Uh, given the latest development, the economic challenges and so forth, and the von der Leyen leadership, do you think it's become, it's become more um, likely that there will be a fiscal union in the future to, with the EU budget? And the second uh, question is, um, does the ECB with the latest development also have an imp um, impact or let's say influence on the um, um, uh, budgetary discipline of governments? I remember this was the big thing. Um, or is it rather up to the European Commission to control uh, the budget planning of the nation states? Thank you. Okay. Maybe the second uh, question first, and then uh, fiscal union. I don't think it is the business of the ECB or central bank to tell governments what they should do with the budget. That's the independence of a central bank. If the, the central banks tell politicians that's what you have to do, they will not be surprised that at some point politicians turn back and say, you central bank, that's what you should do. So independence means independence. It means that you don't accept others to tell you what to do, 
But that also means that you should refrain telling these what to do. So that's one point I want to make here. This being said, I think we should have sound budgetary policies and sustainable budgetary policies. That, that is key, right? Um, and as you know, this is now being discussed. What exactly does that mean? What kind of rules shall we have to, to, to satisfy? I do think that here we, we should really get out of this carcan of, and maybe we, maybe we now may not agree, of balanced budget over the business cycle. Uh, I think it is key that governments make public investments and that they finance this by issuing bonds. Uh, there's nothing wrong in doing this. If the rate of return of the public investment exceeds the cost of borrowing, governments should do it. And they should not be constrained. But today, the, the fiscal compact that we have um, makes that impossible, right? Except if the European Commission does it. But national governments are not supposed to do that. I think that should be set aside. And then to come to your first question about fiscal union, yeah, I think in the long run we will have to move into such a situation. The, the, the monetary union that we know now is incomplete. It it's, it's only has one leg. That's a monetary leg, right? And they are doing a good job. But still, if you have to walk on one leg, it's not that comfortable. And the other leg, the other leg is a fiscal union. That is key in a full-fledged monetary union. Now, this will take time. Um, I will certainly not see it in my lifetime. It also depends on how you define fiscal union, right? Because it's not black and white. Um, there are gradations. We have already some sort of fiscal union. Like, for example, the European Commission issued these bonds in the context of the next generation EU. These are euro bonds, and they are issued under the responsibility of all the participating countries. So, in a way, we have already a little bit fiscal union, but I do think that we have to move forward to make this thing sustainable in the long run. It's interesting that you've been nodding, uh, Governor Holtzman, and, and for example, Lagarde is keeping telling that governments are making it more difficult for the ECB to, to stick with its targets because they're spending so much. But you seem to agree with this notion that, that the ECB should stay out of, of the spending debate and how much can government spend? Well, I have to say one should definitely not tell the Minister of Financial that, uh, but one should also say if and as, uh, as we had recently had that <coughs> We want to reduce the, uh, the inflation. If you continue spending, if you create, how to say, a fiscal inflation, you will not get down the inflation as soon as uh, you would like to have. I think this is a, a remark you're allowed to make. Tell them, you know, if you, if you compensate uh, people too much in, in a way which is not targeted, then you are contradicting what we are doing. So don't be surprised that in this case we have to increase the interest rate further than we would like to do it. I think these kind of things are correct and this, uh, this is uh, permitted. And this tip these things typically happen when I mean, every half a year we meet in an informal ECOFIN, Ministers of Finance, Governors, where we exchange these views, what will happen. And this not, I tell you what to do, it's more an exchange. Uh, in, in, in this way there. So I think, uh, I think this is uh, perfectly correct. But on the monetary union, and out of it, in order to have a little conference, otherwise it looks like I was on the same side of it, I think we already have a major part of uh, fiscal interaction. We have, how to say, the normal budget, not a lot, but still, uh, which uh, is used in order to spend on special programs, which are typically helping on the social, on the economic part of it. Uh, we have uh, now this huge program of uh, uh, 750 billion, which is spent uh, on, on, on priority areas. And we have, and this is why one should talk about the fiscal uh, union, we already have a fund in case of, which allows us to intervene and to safeguard our countries, which for which you typically needed a, a fiscal union. So we have many of the elements there. 
but also what it would mean is then a real fiscal union would take a lot of our competences to the center. And frankly speaking, uh, my, uh, my understanding is not that the European Commission would be able a much larger uh, uh, spending out of it. So I prefer to have our national governments of doing it and finesse what we have, for, but not move towards the state. Okay. It may happen, but not after we are not here future. anymore. I think there was another question somewhere. <clears throat> um, my name is Andreas Carey, and my, my question is about uh, the nature of inflation and what it means for the inflation target. So I understood there is a discussion out there which says that our current very high inflation rate is not only due to excessive liquidity going back to 2009 and, and excessive uh, savings during the corona pandemic, which then had an overshoot in, in demand, but also in terms of having structural limitations, less supply in terms of energy, agricultural products, also due to climate change and so forth. People saying that we are moving into an area of higher persistent price pressures. Um, and there are also then people saying that maybe this 2% target might be too low uh, given these price pressures and too tight uh, for the economy. I'm not saying this, this is my opinion, but I would like to hear your opinion about it. Um, maybe if, if I can bring you, what, what's uh, your impression that are we moving to, to uh, a phase of high inflation and especially globalization, I think, would be one more thing you could mention that there's a pushback on globalization, on cheap products coming from China and so on. Yeah. I mean, that's part of what I referred to also in the beginning of um, that a lot of structural shifts are ongoing and there's a lot of uncertainty about it. I, I think it would be nice to be able to answer your question, but I'm afraid um, um, I don't know a person who, who, who can with a lot of certainty say that. I mean, what, what's for sure, I guess, is that the inflationary environment we have seen in the last 10 years is over. Um, for a Euro, Euro area perspective, that also means the 2% is again in reach, right? So on a, on a, on a positive, positive note. Um, however, it's clear that, um, and that there are challenges out there which uh, might Im imply, in general, a more volatile macroeconomic environment, including a more volatile inflationary environment. Um, I mean, I'm not a central banker, but I would agree that now it's not the right time to discuss adjusting um, the, the two percent target. So let's see where we stand in 2025, uh, and then also we might have more clarity about shifts in globalization uh, uh, and also what implications the investments in climate change uh, will bring for inflation. Okay, growth. Um, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I think uh, the number of good reasons why one shouldn't do it. The one is. You lose credibility if suddenly you move towards a goal and say, oh, actually, I don't want to have it. Because this uh, would create also difficulties for the next goal, so you shouldn't do it. Second one is uh, 2 or 4% looks innocent. Well, what's, what's the act? If you do a simple calculate, you know, after 10 years, the difference makes huge differences there. And it creates that highly redistributive effects there, uh, what you're would not like to have it. And number three is, it's not a coincidence that all big economies have the 2% goal there. It's a kind of a compromise, uh, 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 but it is a good compromise and is considered as an almost optimal state, uh, to, at least to our knowledge. Okay. Good I'd like to shift the focus to another aspect of the poly crisis, if I may. Namely, I know the UNB has been doing a lot of thinking about the development of cyber currencies, including central bank digital currencies. But recently, we've seen the failure of some quite large cyber currency companies. Uh, we've also most recently heard reports that Hamas and others have used cyber currencies to fund their operations. So in the light of these news, do you think that central banks and the regulators need to a bit rethink their strategy and perhaps apply more brakes to ensure these both financial and also geopolitical 
stability threats are addressed before the sector develops too, too far? I know that there is, we do a lot of thinking. And to make it easier, we're, time is running slowly out. <laughs> no, the, the, I mean, cyber currency is not a currency if you think about Bitcoin, you know. It's, it's an asset. It's not a currency. And, uh, and the way it is currently running, you know, it's more an electronic uh, pyramid game than, a, than an asset, you know. You can use it, but it's not really helping out there. This is, in my view, totally distinct from the question of uh, an uh, CBDC, a, a central bank digital currency. This is something which uh, is there in order to complement uh, the cash. As cash is diminishing, you want to have uh, a central bank money in the hand of individuals, because if individuals pay with their smartphone and others, they're using uh, commercial money not central bank money. And uh, why should they do so? Well, for different reasons, because it allows, uh, how to say, much more equal access than to, the, uh, to the, uh, any kind of commercial part of it. But also from a very simple point of view, as it's central bank money, you know we are banker and we have to finance our, 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 our transactions. And uh, uh, how to say, are making money out of... Uh, 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 asking people to hold money which is non-remunerated, uh, seniorage has been important in the past and is still today uh, to have it. So there are many reasons why it's important to have in the future CBDC. Uh, just at the finish with that, uh, this is something where we're in the middle of uh, getting the details together and we have a lot of discussion here, but I assume this would be a special panel in the future in order to discuss it in detail. I think we have a last question from the audience. Last question from the audience. Um, would it be also politically more intelligent for the banks to uh, be less restrictive about corporate and private loans and uh, credit access and use this excess capital for the revi revival of the corporate investments? Banker? Huh? <laughs> it's a good question for it's him. A banker, exactly. Huh? exactly. It's a, it's a question banker. for a banker. A real banker. <laughs> <laughs> Not a central banker. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. I think you have to pass on this one. <laughs> And actually, I think it's quite difficult because in Austria, it's, I think, not the banks being so restrictive, no, but it's the, the what we call Aufsicht, the central bank and, and um, other, other financial oversight institutions where we have a big discussion. I don't know if you want to add. Otherwise, I will put my last question. Uh, Please do, sir. If, I mean, it's always difficult to predict the future, but um, a short answer from all of you. If, if in the next coming of months or, or years, do you have like a feeling or expectation what would be a big topic? I mean, one guess, uh, when I started working for my company, the big topic was the Euro crisis in countries like Ireland, Greece, etc., coming to high problems. Not that interest rates are rising so much. Could this come back, or will it be central banks keep raising rates because we have 4% inflation and they be maniac about we have to have two and whatever we do and never get it? Or what would be the big, big topic which we'll be discussing next year or the year after? Who wants to have a guess on that? Well, history tells us that we always fail to forecast what the big topic will be next year, right? <laughs> So how could I, or my colleagues, forecast what the big topic next would year will be? This is going to be extremely difficult. But would you... Because we don't know what could happen. I mean, but we mentioned anything. Italy, but is there a fear that this could come back, like a Euro crisis 2.0? Yeah, with rising in, interest rates? Not in the form that we have seen it, because the Euro system has changed, right? Uh, um, when, when they had the Euro crisis, it was unclear, for example, what the role of the central bank, of the ECB was. Um, there has been a lot of dispute during two years, from 2010 to 2012, what the ECB should do. Now it's much clearer what the ECB should do if we had a similar crisis. So therefore, if there is a crisis, it will be very different from the one that we experienced in 2010, 2012. Um, that's one thing. Um, 
But so many things can happen. But let me shift to inflation now, because that we understand a little bit better. I'm relatively optimistic that we can eliminate inflation, that we go, go back to 2%. Uh, and for several reasons, one is actually inflation is mainly the result of a demand shock and temporary supply problems. But they are over. They are mostly over. And it's just a demand shock. And then the central bank just has to make sure that demand is constrained for a while. And this then leads to a decline in inflation. And we see it. Inflation has been going down. In fact, when you look at the graph of inflation in the Eurozone, the decline is faster than the increase. That's really remarkable, right? So, and I think this will go on so that in one year, we will barely talk about inflation. If, if that's the <laughs> forecast you like, um, that's my forecast. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's interesting, though. I think it would be a good question if life then would be better or worse for many of the people, as we have now basically highly any unemployment left in Austria and many other countries. So there's also a good side uh, of it, I would say, which is not often talked about. But Salzman, do you do you euro crisis? Or I think you would agree that there's not a high, high chance of, of coming back. I think we have learned a lot. And we have also enhanced institution in a way which is difficult visible. Uh, when the crisis building on the uh, property crisis in the US uh, started, we had essentially no mechanism in order to offer supervision of banks. And at this time, bank had half of the equity <coughs> capital what we have nowadays, so the, that we have nowadays. So banks have now buffers, we didn't have it. And this is a major progress what we had. So our financial system is much more stable than in the past. But which doesn't mean that not a problem may lurk. Even nowadays, for example, there's still, how to say, fear. Think about uh, these uh, loans uh, for, uh, uh, for property, uh, construction, etc. And the, the loans have very low rates. Somebody has to take on the risk. We know where a lot of the risk is, but we don't know all of the risk. So we may at one moment have this risk coming up. up. And this is something which keeps me sometimes awake. And especially those buffers not having been tested. I mean, I guess the Credit Suisse, if you would have talked a couple of months ago, uh, also the Swiss well, regulator would have said how topic, save all the Swiss but banks. A different one. This may be also one of the reasons. You're last uh, point from your side. So you okay. have been seeing, we have been seeing basically interest rates going up in the last couple of weeks in the US for Italy. Is this something of, of concern from your side? I don't think that we will see another euro area crisis. It would gain focus, I guess, over the next couple of months. Today, in a year's time, I think we will talk about a US election, <laughs> I would say. Um, we will also talk about how, um, to what level central banks will cut rates. Um, and I hope we don't talk about geopolitics anymore. So quite some optimistic points. Uh, so Mr. Holzmann, uh, Professor Groff, and Mr. So well, thank you very much for having this interesting discussion. I think we had many interesting points about we learned something about this excess uh, remuneration of, of banks. Uh, what's the problem behind it? This massive amount of cash coming and we heard some of the very interesting, at least from my point of view, discussions inside the ECB about this uh, problem and sharing it with some perspective uh, also from, from the banks and some very interesting insights on inflation. So thank you very much for, for discussing with us. And I think there are some drinks and snacks. So there's some time for socializing as well. And my name is Anders Sigetberg from The Standard. And happy to see you the next time around. And have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>